Hello and welcome to another one in our series of videos on the Scottish Wars of Independence. This one deals with the events uh, from 1308-39, Robert the Bruce defeating his enemies in Scotland. The aim of this video is to learn how Bruce overcame his Scottish enemies. By the end of it, we should be able to describe how Bruce campaigned against his enemies in Scotland in 1308-39. Be able to explain how Bruce stamped out Scottish resistance through his own rule in northern and western Scotland, and be able to make a considered assessment of why Bruce acted as he did at this time. So to begin, to begin with some context before we kick off, in 1308 Bruce was riding high. In 1307 he defeated the English army of Eamon de Blanche down in Ayrshire, and he had hot-footed it up north as Edward I's massive, vengeful English army was making its way north. The old King Edward I had died at Burrow on Sands in sight of Scotland on the shores of the Solway Firth and his son chose not to pursue the invasion and let Bruce off the hook. Bruce scampered north up the Great Glen, facing down common strongholds one by one until he occupied Moray and Buchan and there he was struck down by a serious illness and it looked for a time as if all was lost yet his health rallied and with it the fortunes of his army and he was able to defeat the commons at the battle of Inverurie outside old Meldrum. This is where the events of this video take off. Now this is um, in the last video where I immediately finished by asking the question what would Bruce have done next after he had conquered his main rivals, his main indigenous rivals in Scotland, the common family. How would he deal with them? How would he make sure that that problem didn't raise its head again in the future? And this is the answer to how he did that. The harrying of Buchan. So between 1298 and 1304, the Guardians of Scotland had fought a defensive struggle. Consistently, they, they realised that they didn't have the field army to meet these uh, continual English invasions. So they fought with guerrilla tactics, staying in English where they could, but often falling back in the face of the advance, allowing the English to ravage lands and do the damage they could, knowing that the English would usually just go home for the winter and give the Scots a chance to regenerate their strength. By contrast, in 1307, Bruce has turned the tide. He's now leading a war of aggression, directed against those lords and families who had led that earlier struggle and later submitted to Edward. These men in Bruce's eyes are turncoats to the Scottish cause. So as with all of these videos as we go through, uh, candidates, students of higher history, um, it's a good idea to take down the points in bold as your notes as we go through. So please do follow through with me. Feel free to pause the video as we go through. But take a note of this. The key point, Bruce's victory over the Commons at the Battle of Inverurie in May 1308 was a major achievement for his cause. This is a huge step and Bruce making his kingship of Scotland formal and to make it stick, to be recognised. After the victory, Bruce ordered his brother, Edward Bruce, the sole surviving uh, brother he had, to lay waste to the entire earldom of Buchan as punishment for their resistance. Now you remember uh, from our last video, Bruce is still seriously, gravely ill um, after the campaign of the winter of 1307 into 1308. At many points during that campaign, he was on death's door. He was being carried around by his army on a litter. And indeed, at the Battle of Inverurie, he had to be strapped onto a horse to sit upright and be seen by his men. So he's in no position to carry out this uh, campaign of punishment against the commons. His younger, fitter, healthier brother is instead given the command to carry out his wishes. And he did so with gusto. The hiring of Buchan, or the hairship of Buchan as it's sometimes called, lasted for weeks. Bruce wanted to, the main common power base to be permanently smashed. He does not want the common family able to rise up against them once again. So everyone still loyal to the common cause was killed. Houses and farmsteads were burned, castles were pulled down, livestock was slaughtered, whilst crops are burned and the land was tainted. We have accounts of Bruce's soldiers pouring lime into the soil, changing the pH of it to make sure that crops would not grow in it for years to come. 
He has destroyed the lands of the commons just as he has destroyed them. He's taken away their strongholds. He has killed their people, the peasants who would man their armies and pay their taxes. And he has destroyed their natural resources. There is no power base left in the north of Scotland for the commons to make their comeback after the Bruce is done with them. It was genocide against his own Scottish people. But, Bruce might argue, needs must. The chronicler Barber tells us that men grieved over the hership for 50 years or more. That's two generations, almost three, that the harsh cruelty of Bruce's actions were felt by those people in the north. The land was depopulated. The land was made barren. And as the agricultural heartland of Scotland, Buchan had been heavily populated before the Bruce came there. It was the end of the common hold over Scotland's northeast. Bruce's barbarous treatment of the North East showed that he could use terror effectively. It served as a powerful incentive to persuade others to come to terms. An example of this is the Earl of Ross, who you may remember from the previous video, had tried to block Bruce's advance up the Great Glen towards Inverness in the winter of 1307, but who had backed down at the approach of Bruce's army and written an apologetic letter to his liege lord, Edward II. The Earl of Ross uh, eventually surrendered at Alludern near Inverness in late October 1308 to officially join the Bruce's cause. So powerful lords across Scotland are starting to see the way the wind is blowing and to come across to Bruce's side. The common defeat led to Bruce capturing Aberdeen from its English garrison. This city is a key stronghold for any lord who's trying to control the Kingdom of Scotland. It's out of range of English attacks. Aberdeen is a massive march for any army starting as far south as the heartlands of England. It's a long way to go. It also offers excellent North Sea trade links to German and Flemish merchants. The port quickly became Bruce's gateway for supplies from the continent. Before the Wars of Independence, Scotland had rich trading links with something called the Hanseatic League. That is a chain of cities, free ports across the whole of Northern Europe and up into the Baltic Sea that form part of a trading network. Scotland exported out wool and in return it brought in metal and weapons. Bruce is going to need these to equip his army in the next stage of the war against England. The possession of Aberdeen allows Bruce's army a vital opportunity to build up their supplies, weapons and armour for the fight ahead. With the north east of Scotland securely under his thumb, Bruce now had the freedom to direct his attention to the west. After defeating the commons, Bruce marched west to attack their powerful allies, the McDougals of Lorne. The McDougals had their seat at Dunstaffnage Castle just to the east of Oban and Bruce had had a run-in with them only a couple of years before. The McDougals were a powerful Highland clan who did not fear Bruce. They had in fact inflicted a stinging defeat on him only two years before at Dalry to the northeast of Loch Awe. The McDougals were the lords of the Western Isles and they had only been part of the Kingdom of Scotland since Alexander III had won them over in 1266. They long viewed themselves as independent of the Scots kings. They used to doing their own thing. They don't like to be told what to do. So in August 1308, Bruce asserted his power with speed and violence. Enlisting the help of the McDougal's blood feud enemies, the McDonald's, Bruce made straight for the McDougal heartlands and met their army at the Pass of Brander. Now, the Pass of Brander is the narrow canyon uh, surrounding the northwestern arm of Loch Awe. The modern road goes through the Pass of Brander as you drive from Loch Gilped up towards Oban. You pass the Kruken Dam and you go through the narrow mouth of the pass. Now, in medieval times, there's an even narrower route to cut through. So the battle took place there on the route west towards Oban. 
the aged chief of McDougal's, Alexander McDougal, was too elderly and sick to lead their army. He lay in bed in Dunstaffnage Castle a few miles away, leaving his son, John Bachach, to lead the fighting. The McDougals had sought to ambush the Bruce, just as they had at Dalry a couple of years before. Their army lay in wait, hiding in the trees on the hillside, overlooking the road at the Pass of Branda. They had hoped for a repeat of their victory over Bruce at Dalry when they had basically mugged the retreating king's army. This time, however, Bruce is experienced enough to avoid their trap. He has become a savvy guerrilla fighter. He sent his loyal lieutenant, James Douglas, ahead with a band of Highlanders even higher up the sides of Ben Kruken, taking up a hidden position behind the McDougals. Bruce intended to ambush the ambushers. So when McDougals sprung their trap to attack Bruce as he marched by, they found themselves instead caught in a trap between Bruce to the front and Douglas furiously charging down the hill on top of them to their rear. And caught in an ambush this time of Bruce's making, the Argyle men wavered and then they broke. The McDougal soldiers fled and they were chased all the way back to Nudstaffnage Castle by Oban, pictured here. John Bachach took to his galley on Loch Awe and he fled south. He eventually took refuge as an exile in England. He left his father, Alexander McDougal, the elderly Lord of Argyll, alone in the castle. He soon surrendered uh, his forces and did homage to Bruce. This marked the fall of the last common stronghold in Scotland. Now, as Bruce had besieged on Staffnage, John Bachach had wrote to Edward II for help, saying that Bruce had 15,000 men against his 800, and that he could not be sure of the loyalty of any of his neighbours. Edward II did not reply, and the castle quickly fell. And Staffnage Castle was removed from McDougal hands and it remained royal property for the next 150 years. So to enforce his authority, Bruce not only took the castle, he ordered the McDougal lands in Argyll and Kintyre to be harried just as he had those of the commons in Buchan. If you stand up to Bruce, you will pay the price. With the Western Isles in hand, Bruce sent his brother, Edward Bruce, along with Sir James Douglas, southwest to deal with the commons of Galloway. Now, Galloway is down in the southwest corner of Scotland, near the border with England. So, along with their prosperous heartlands in the northeast, the Coman family also held lands in Galloway, neighbouring the Bruce's own power base down at Carrick. Bruce and Douglas's attacks there were so violent that some of the Gallovidians, what an awesome word, apparently if you live in Galloway you're a Gallovidian, amazing. So some of these Gallovidians fled across the border to England for safety. It's said that the ravaging carried out in Galloway was worse than that endured in Buchan. The mind boggles at what those people must have gone through. Some Gallovidian communities sought to buy off Bruce's attacks rather than see their homes destroyed. Bruce used this money to pay for mercenaries for his army. So you can see by the end of this section of today's video, Common family has been smashed. The Allies have been smashed. Bruce has removed his Scottish enemies from Scotland. He can now concentrate on the main foe, the English. The Declaration of the Clergy. One by one, the Scottish nobles were declaring their support for Bruce. He demonstrated his competence by defeating both Scottish and English opponents in battle. To show his new authority, Bruce held his first official parliament at St Andrews, shown in the background here, in March 1309. The medieval parliaments are a special event. It's not like nowadays where a modern parliament will sit for the bulk of the year. A medieval parliament lasts a few days to a week or two and it's unlikely that you see more of than one of them happening in a year. It is a chance for the king to gather together his bishops and his nobles and decide on the business of the kingdom for that year and possibly a few years ahead. So this is Bruce calling together his loyal nobles to basically lay down what his policy is going to be to bring this war to the English. It's likely he chose St Andrews, as at that time, this building shown in the background was at the height of its splendour. It was a jewel of Scotland and also the 
place where the relics of Scotland's patron saints, St Andrew, were kept. It is the holiest place in the kingdom, a place of power and a place of prestige. For Bruce to attach his name for that shows how his reputation has grown in the years since the devastation of 1306. The French king, Philip IV, recognised Bruce's growing power and he sent an emissary, an ambassador, officially recognising Bruce as the new king over John Balliol. Now that's quite a big deal. Kings usually have to die to be replaced or superseded by the next man or lady. Balliol is not dead. If you remember from earlier in our course, in 1296, Edward invaded and removed Balliol from the throne of Scotland. He had him arrested and taken to the Tower of London. We spent some years in basically house arrest. I'm not going to call it jail. And then due to bargaining with the Pope, uh, Edward was forced to release him. But Balliol, rather than come home to Scotland to retake his throne, fled to his family lands in France, where he was still living all these years later on. By the time of Bruce's Parliament in 1309, Balliol is 60 years old, living out his exile at his family estates in Helicor in Picardy, France. There's no sign that Balliol's going to come back. And the fact that King Philip, a foreign king, has now recognised Bruce, underlines the fact that Balliol is now done as King of Scotland. There is no coming back for this man. Bruce is it. Scotland's bishops also publicly proclaimed that Bruce's right to succession, once again publicly granting him absolution for his sacrilege in murdering the Red Common in Greyfriars Kirk in 1306. Now remember though, the Pope in Rome wasn't so easy going on Bruce and had excommunicated him, cut him out of the church and declared him a non-person um, for the sin of spilling blood on Holy Land. So the Pope has not forgiven him, even if the Scottish Church has. So the bishops issued a joint declaration of approval of Bruce's kingship called the Declaration of the Clergy. Now this saw Bruce starting a propaganda campaign to match his military campaign to legitimise himself as the rightful king of Scotland. It's one thing to build an army and to go around killing all your enemies and telling people you're the king. It's another thing to be recognised by the powers that be, the church and the people, as legal, just king of a land. Bruce is achieving the former, his military strength has overcome his uh, Scottish rivals, but he has not done enough yet to be officially recognised across Europe as the rightful king of Scotland yet. So the Parliament of St Andrews is significant as it shows how much of Scotland supported Bruce by early 1309. It also shows by omission, however, that many powerful nobles were still opposed or indifferent towards him. Not all the powerful and the good of Scotland showed up to that parliament in 1309. By August 1309, Bruce held all of Scotland north of the River Tay. Edward II of England's loyalists and garrisons still held all of Lothian in the southeast of Scotland, all the borders, and they had outposts at Dundee, Stirling, and Perth. So it's fair to say the English still hold quarter of the kingdom together with one of the most powerful and significant strongholds in the entire land at Stirling. By 1309 Scotland's civil war however between the Bruce and the Commons seemed over but the war with England would soon heat up again. So to finish off today's video our big questions are these. Was Bruce right to be so harsh in his treatment of his Scottish enemies in 1308 to 1309? Was it right for him to basically commit genocide against Scottish citizens? And not just once, in Buchan, in Argyll, and in the ravaging of the common lands in Galloway? Was that the right thing to do? Did he have to do it? Was he justified? And in your own words, explain the indicators which show Bruce's tactics were a success in 1308 to 1309. Bruce has come so far in the three years since he was defeated roundly by English and Scottish armies as he made his bid to take the throne. How has he achieved these successes? What tactics has he employed to make sure that he is now moving into pole position for control of Scotland? So that's it for today. 
Thanks so much for listening. See you next time.